Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for September 28, 2020. I'm your host, Jeanette dopp -Heidi. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Accord, integrating CI policy and mechanism to support research on sensitive data. Uh, our presenters are Ron Hutchins, uh, Tho Wen, and Neil McGee. Uh, before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Uh, second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. Uh, click on the chat icon and type in your question, um, but we also plan on uh, taking time at the end for uh, questions as well. And with that, I will hand things off to Ron. Ron, welcome. Thanks, Jeanette. I appreciate your uh, inviting us to be here today. Uh, to start off quickly, um, Accord is a community that we've built around uh, using computation for sensitive data in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, the community has been a viable community for probably nearly three years. About a year ago, we uh, received an NSF award, NSF MRI award. Uh, thank you, NSF, for supporting us with it. Uh, we also received a supplement for hosting COVID research from around the country. Uh, and, and in the process of uh, building the community, we've been building infrastructure. Uh, we have a large computer that hosts uh, virtual machines and moving into containers that uh, Neil will talk about more. Uh, I'm just doing the intro here today, and I've got two of our folks here who are, are key in the project that are going to do the presentation. Uh, Tho Nguyen is a senior scientist in the computer science uh, department and engineering school at University of Virginia. Uh, Tho was a AAAS fellow at NSF before he came to Virginia. Uh, Neil McGee is a solutions architect in the research computing department at uh, University of Virginia, and Neil came to us from commercial industry before he came. So let me turn it to Tho to kick us off with the presentation and then uh, Neil will follow and then we'll have questions at the end. But as Jeanette said, feel free to post questions in the chat if you'd like to. Tho, go ahead. If you're Sorry. talking, yeah. I started talking and then <laughs> the whole mute thing got me again. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Ron, for that in introduction, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. Um, before uh, we get into uh, essentially a, um, a technical journey with uh, Neil, I would like to take the opportunity to um, frame the, um, the system that we're trying to build and, and position the, the challenges that we are um, working on, and um, sort of like try to try to give you a um, an overview of, um, of of what we hope to accomplish with Accord. Um, I believe that for most of you, um, a lot of this is um, familiar, at least familiar, and um, hopefully not too familiar. Um, if they are too familiar, I, I did add some animations um, to keep you interested. So uh, hopefully there's, there's a little bit of everything for everyone here. Um, let's get started. So there we go. Um, Accord is um, our punchline is as as you as you probably saw in the um, title page. We're trying to support uh, collaborative collaborative research computing, and it's 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 a bunch of very well used words, right? Co collaborative research, but um, we do deep dive into it, and and we we run into some challenges that we want to um, to point out to you, and um, it starts with uh, we're trying to do research in the age of regulations, it's, it's, um, it's, it's very simple. We, we're collecting more data and, and uh, we're trying to understand them. Um, but we've also gotten good at getting that information from the data. So it makes a lot of sense that there are regulations put in place to protect the, um, uh, some of the, the subjects that the, this data is describing. Um, so it's, uh, um, while it um, hinders our, our progress somewhat, it's, it's sort of like these extra constraints we, we do understand and, and we are very, um, uh, supportive of having these re regulations in place, um, and let's let's first start with this oversimplification of um, what it is, uh, what research computing is um, from our perspective. Um, we start with at, at a very 
foundation, compute and storage resources. That's what researchers want to get to, and that's what we want to give to them. Um, they want some place to store the data, and they want to run their algorithms and, and just do their research. But then um, we build another layer around that to um, essentially protect ourselves, um, security, um, being able to build this um, trusted C um, cyber infrastructure. And then, you know, the, as, as you all uh, know, and we had a brief discussion um, just now about what, what, what security means. And it's um, a lot of the time the, uh, the weak point uh, with the, the people, the users themselves. And so then we, we add these um, safe practices um, in place to, to really help us secure the system. And, but, but then we're talking about um, now when it comes to regulations, doing so is not enough. We have to really prove that, that we are meeting all these regulations that are in place, these, um, these guidelines. And so what does it mean? What does it mean to be um, a compliant infrastructure? And so we have to show um, our security and our safe pr practices are meeting these guidelines and um, more or less, in a sense, make, make it provable. And then the, the challenge is, what, is, what does provable mean? And, um, and I think you, um, you will also agree with my slide title there that um, compliant CI is really a, a non-deterministic enterprise. There's really no cut and dry answer. There's really no, like you're doing it right or you're doing it wrong. It's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a gray area that we're trying to um, work on. And so what does uh, provable means is we, we build documentations showing that we're meeting these um, these regulations, and then we perform audits off and on to um, to make sure that we're we're on task, and then um, they identify weak points and such. And so the um, the, uh, the the whole point of it is with the, between the documentations and the, the auditing, um, we then present a case, and then somebody, um, essentially our lawyers, decide that it's it's an acceptable risk. Um, that again, the, the the point is, is 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 there's no right or wrong um, whether you uh, you doing it um, correctly, but whether the risk is acceptable um, to the the services or to the return, which are the research computing services. And so um, we draw a um, a square around it, a boundary around it, um, which is the institution. And so the the, the punchline then is um, compliance or acceptable risk. Um, is really an institutional process, right? gathering the documentation, doing the auditing, and then it's an institutional decision um, to accept that. And ultimately, uh, then compliant CI remains an institutional service. Um, it is not something that um, we traditionally are able to offer to um, our collaborators, our partners, um, for this very reason, uh, because we can't just say we have a compliant infrastructure. And so, but that is the goal of a core. A core is, um, as Ron described, is a community. Um, our goal is to be able to offer um, high performance research computing resources and services um, and compliant capable infrastructure to um, those, especially to, to a partner, but especially those at institutions that aren't able to make the same investments themselves. Right? Um, and so if these institutions are gonna send their users to our um, to our infrastructure and, and use them. What is it that they need? Uh, what are the, what is it that they're looking for, to, to for them to be able to do that? Um, at the very least, um, at the very least, they need some assurances, um, plus potentially other things. Um, again, that the the, uh, the the idea is each of these part uh, the institution will have to make the decision themselves. And so they were gonna want as much as possible assurances and or evidence um, of us meeting certain um, requirements. And then um, from our side, what do we need for, for us in order to open up our infrastructure for external uh, users? And, and then, then it circles back to, we need to somehow uh, make the risk acceptable. And same goes for our research partners. And then the, um, the um, ultimately it's, it's, a, it's a risk management challenge between the two of us. So making the, the cyber infrastructure, the policies and, 
and all the, the, the processes is, is a balance of risk management. And so um, here are some of the key ingredients for risk management that we, um, we're working on. At uh, the very f um, core of it is, a, um, is an agreement uh, between the, um, us and our partners. And then um, on top of the agreement, and then I'll go into details on these components um, very shortly, on some documentations that we provide um, to, as evidence. And then we also um, do provide continuous validation um, of our infrastructure as well. Uh, perform con continuous checking and, and, and validation and make that accessible to our partners. Uh, with regard to the agreement, um, that's the, and we're, we are building it out right now. We have um, early versions for um, our Virginia partners and we're happy to share them with you. And in fact, we're looking for folks to help us um, build these um, agreements and make them acceptable. So um, there are some very key things, uh, like the agreements are between the institutions, not between um, uh, the institution and individual researchers. Um, things like assume your own risk, uh, please don't sue, um, you know, please have insurance, that kind of thing. And then the, the asterisk uh, uh, to indicate that different versions of the, um, the agreements, um, which have different levels of, um, of requirements are for um, uh, different cases um, or the different um, institutions that we're working with. And then um, documentations, you know, for example, onboarding and training material that we're, we're asking folks to, uh, to go through when they use our system. And we're sharing that with our partners because um, it may or may not be adequate on your side to determine whether um, this is compliant, like that's enough or not. Um, you might wanna do more. Uh, we, will, we will describe in details our technical de uh, deployment, uh, the system that we built and, and some of the mechanisms, uh, the, uh, all the mechanisms. Um, we'll log user activities um, and we'll make that available on the request. Um, and um, uh, the, the documentation that we, we build for our own auditing purposes, uh, we can share that as well. Right. Um, and on, on validation, um, we want to, Quickly, just um, again, oversimplify this, this trust model that we're, we're, we're working on. So at, at the very fundamental part, um, at the very core of it is trust via control. This is, this is um, University of Virginia working with our own researchers and our own system. Like we own the system, we control it. And so we um, trust it um, to a certain extent. And, and, and that's what we've been working with. Uh, external partners that we uh, collaborate with, we bring them onto our system, create guest accounts and such. In a sense, we bring it in into our control. And that's, that's been our trust. Um, the other one is um, trust via assurances. Um, if we have, you know, uh, an example is a, um, another partner universities, public universities in Virginia, Virginia that we work with. And that is, um, there are some assurances in there. Um, for example, we're all part of the same attorney general because we're all public universities, so we're all state employees. We can't sue each other. Um, we know we all have this insurance. We, we all know that we're part of some framework and we have an agreement signed. So these are the assurances that allow us to, to expand our trust circles. Up. And then ultimately, there's an environment where there's zero trust. There are partners that we don't um, have uh, much assurances on. And in, in such case, um, we assume when we assume zero trust, we have some, uh, we will build some assurances via the um, agreement, for example, but we will want to add validation on it. Um, and that's what our partners want as well. And uh, for so, um, an example is we are um, deploying, we, we, we want to do continuous monitoring um, and analysis, analysis of the, um, um, of, of the core system, uh, net, network traffic and such. Um, and, and make that accessible to our partners. And that's the validation that we, we, uh, we want to um, provide. So for example, um, we're, deploy we're deploying um, a, a network um, sensor tool called um, Argus. And um, they are part of, um, they're built by Cochian, LLC, Q-O-S-I-E-N-T, I believe. Um, it's been around for a while. Um, I'm, I won't go into what they do here, but um, you can essentially deploy them on your VMs and um, they'll, they'll generate network data that's um, 
more detailed than uh, NetFlow, for example. And then we will provide these, uh, we will analyze this data um, and um, justify the analysis that we, we do and then how they support these controls, the security controls. Um, and then um, we will do so continuously and then we make that um, artifacts available um, to our partners. Um, uh, just, just a quick um, example, and then this is uh, the work that we are, we're working with um, Koshint um, on with Argus, is um, again, we, we'll design, we'll justify, and we'll share the analytics. And then um, uh, more importantly, uh, we map them to specific controls that um, um, a court is claiming to meet. And so um, um, just a couple, I mean, there's a, there's a larger documentation uh, and each of the controls are more detailed, but uh, a couple of examples on information flow enforcement or remote access. And then, you know, these are the kind of analysis that we were able to do from uh, the, the Argus generated data. And then, um, you know, claiming that these are the, the, the validations that, uh, that, that we are working on for these controls. And so making that available to our partners. Um, and so that, um, I want to switch gear a little bit. Um, I see some, potentially some chat showed up, but um, since I haven't been interrupted, I don't believe there has been any questions. Uh, but um, so, so that frames the, uh, the, the system that we're, that we're building, um, the, 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 the mechanism and um, some of the activities we're working, what we're providing to our partners and, and, and and what we hope to get from them. Now I want to um, switch gear a little bit and um, go into the uh, the core system itself, the technical build itself. And then uh, Neil is gonna take over and talk about that. But I wanna just um, quickly talk about some of the components that we are, uh, we're putting together. Um, onboarding, right? um, it seems like a sort of like a almost trivial step, but I, I think um, working in this space, we all agree that onboarding is, is pretty critical step, um, a pretty critical component that we're building into a court. Um, of course, we're working on authentication, authoriz authorization, uh, the monitoring and verification that I just talked about, some um, hard enforcement um, rules that we're, mechanism that we're putting in, and of course, um, some of these documentations and, um, and the ability to observe our system and um, also balancing it all with um, usability. And, and so now I'll, I'll hand this back, uh, I hand this over to Neil to, to talk about the Accor system and then um, at the end, uh, I'll circle back with uh, just one last slide uh, for you guys. Neil, I'm gonna stop sharing and then- uh, you can Awesome, okay. Go over. Thank you here, if you can see that. <clears throat> Yep, can we can see it. Awesome, thanks. Okay, so uh, yeah, thanks Tho for that. And I mean, it's so, you know, Tho and Ron came to me, I don't know, a year and a half ago and the grant was looking real positive and we were trying to think of how to um, embody this technically. And Jim Jokel here at UVA has been working with them for a long time um, through the whole proposal process. And and Jim just saying, kept saying, containers, containers, containers. Um, and so, I think what's happened is a kind of a nice story and I'd like to kind of share the story with you because we've been doing sensitive computing, um, computing on sensitive data of various levels at UVA for a while now, almost four years in a system called Ivy. And so let me sort of show you what that system looks like and then tell you what we bumped up against as users have been living into it. So Ivy's in a high security zone, uh, lives on physical host machines. We run OpenStack on top of that, then we create custom virtual machines for all the researchers. Um, sometimes those are Windows, sometimes they're Linux. Uh, the Windows folks tend to honestly use Excel. <laughs> so they'll, they'll remote desktop into a VM to use Excel or maybe to use other familiar products that are cross-platform, but they're just used to the environment. Um, and then the Linux users might use a desktop, they might use the command line. But we're connected to a Globus DTN and we've got uh, two petabytes of local storage to Ivy um, that's there. And then it's all, as, as Tho already indicated, it's, it's all run on UVA accounts. So it's a part of the UVA Active Directory. Um, and if you're an outsider and you need to collaborate, then we get you a guest account here. 
Um, so then we have a VPN and the users connect in through the VPN um, using certificates and they can move their data up and down using Globus and have interactive sessions again with, um, with terminals or remote desktops. And this is nice and it's effective and we can do HIPAA and FERPA and CUI data. Uh, Ron and Tho could throw out other lovely acronyms for us, but it works and it's solid. But what we've experienced is that um, all of these VMs become sort of handmade, <laughs> brittle little entities that, uh, that may live for two months, they may live for a year, or they may live for two years. So they have varying life cycles, um, but upgrading them can be difficult because we don't want to break certain packages that a, a researcher may have installed. Um, they sort of need, they need additional software over time, but it's nothing usually all that fancy or complicated. It might be something that we need to review for security purposes, but these are all closed VMs that cannot reach the internet um, in a real lockdown environment. But what we have here, and I think the takeaway I'd like in your minds is to remember that when people are onboarded into the system, it's for a project, you know, project X, and it has team members that go along with that, co-investigators and so on. And then that project is very much bound to the VM itself. So the project, the people, the storage, the VM, they're all wrapped into one entity. So what we wanted to do with Accord is really make that a lot more flexible and kind of break down some of those, some of those static connections. So here's what we're building in Accord is something uh, container and really web driven, at least initially. So again, we have host machines. We run OpenStack on top of that. We run virtual machines with Kubernetes deployed across a fleet, and we can sort of shift those VMs to serve various purposes if we need for HPC or for, for uh, Kubernetes. And then we run environment containers within that. And I'll get, get to what those look like in a second, but the environment containers are short-lived, purpose-driven environments for the researcher to do their work on that particular day. Uh, it's not something that's going to last for three months or a year or two years. It's going to be maybe a few hours or maybe a few days at the most. Um, we love Globus, so we're continuing to use that to get data in and out. It's attached to local storage, so we have six petabytes of GPFS that's local. And then instead of a VPN, which is a bit onerous, we're using an authenticated proxy, uh, which can also do some special tricks. It can, it can look at posture checking for the, for the user's local workstation uh, to see if they're current and if they have all their patching up to date. And so when the user hits that authenticated proxy, they're, they're loading their data through Globus, but when they wanna hit the proxy, they're actually gonna hit a great NSF product called Comanage, which some of you uh, I'm sure are aware of. Comanage is, is great stuff because it allows us to federate. Um, back to everyone's home institution uh, identity provider, basically. So just some examples of arbitrary school logos here that I threw in. Um, what's great is the client hits the proxy. Uh, they're bounced over to co-manage where they select their in common authentication mechanism for their home institution. They're taken to their home institution. They sign in using uh, using their username and password or using a certificate. They're, they use two-factor authentication if they're required, and, and we, want, we very much want that to be required on the home institution end of things and not to add it in again. Um, and then they're allowed through, and they can then enter into their, into their environment itself, this, this container that was created just for them. Um, a quick overview if you haven't worked with Comanage before, this is, <laughs> this is, instead of oversimplified like that was doing, this is overcomplexified. Um, it, so the user on the far left is passing through, um, hits, they initially hit a service provider, which is the app itself, that hits co-manage, which then takes them to InCommon for a lookup of their institution, which then takes them to their home IDP. What's great about co-manage is, A, it doesn't create a whole second set of credentials for everybody. It, it offboards that to the home institutions. But B, it has a great onboarding mechanism, uh, which can be really complex and uh, it can have timers on it so that when, you know, if I'd like to onboard a group of researchers, they could sign a RUDA when they, when they are first onboarded. And then maybe a year later, Comanage will hit them again and say, your RUDA is expired. I need you to, you know, electronically sign one again. 
I can have onboarding workflows for engineers that are simple. I can have them really compli complicated for researchers. You, know, you might want to define RUDA. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, research user data agreement. Research use data agreement. I might be mangling that wrong. Um, but that's basically our legalese for, uh, for compliance for people. Again, I think the hardest thing here is not technical. It's getting the people um, and the governance right. And so the RUDAs for us consist of a PI signing a specific RUDA that they will handle the data accordingly, but that they're also going to be responsible for all team members. And then the team members themselves sign a, a slightly different form of the RUDA. But co-manage gives us essentially a directory, this hybrid directory made up of people from a bunch of different institutions who are members of this virtual organization or the co and co-manages collaborative organization. Um, so it gives us an LDAP to plug into. It gives us a database that's sort of backing that LDAP. Um, and then it gives us this ability to, to have a proxy that, uh, that authenticates people. Um, and really that's the, that's what works the great magic here. It could be a SAML to SAML proxy. You could use OAuth. It could use uh, LDAP and so on. So the, um, the Satosa proxy that's part of CoManage is really um, powerful. So what we envision is using CoManage to onboard people. They could self-subscribe. You know, they could sign themselves up and be putting, put into a holding approval pen, and then a human can come by and approve them. Then at that point, they can create a project. And this is a lot like what the Accord uh, dashboard will look like. So as a member of a project, you can choose which project you want at the top. Um, you know, maybe this, this example has four projects that the person's a member of. And then you select an environment. And we're not trying to offer an unlimited number of those environments, but, but really some flexible uh, pre-vetted container images that people can use. And, and I think as we get deeper in with, with usage, we can start, start to make those containers a bit richer, a bit fuller, branch out a little bit in, in what purposes they serve. Um, and then what you can see here at the bottom is a, uh, sorry, is, um, you know, so here's the current session that you have um, spun up right now, a Python 3.6, and you can connect to it. Um, and this is all over the browser or recent sessions that you've run previously, and you could resume those or you could you could replicate them again. And so coming back to that idea that Ivy is really bound, the project and the people in the storage are all part of a project. What's nice here is that the project and the storage for it and the people for it are a thing in itself, but the environment is completely separate. And you can spin up one environment one day and work with it, maybe in a particular language or maybe deep learning or something like that. And then the next day you could come to your same data sets from a different angle using a different container or a different set of tools. And that's actually what we're seeing in Ivy is people tend to, you know, maybe use two or three sort of suites of tools that they, that they work with their data. Maybe they're crunching things using Python, but maybe they want to visualize things using R or R Studio. Um, so when we talk about environments, we're basically creating a unique endpoint. And here's a typical kind of ugly, uh, you know, bespoke endpoint for a user. So let's say Ron has logged in. He wants a Python 3.6 environment. This is what's created for him. Uh, it's deployed in a few seconds. It's built from this set of vetted images that we control. So it's not a bring your own container environment at all. Uh, because these aren't living on and on and on and running idle for 95% of the time, we can get a lot more usage out of the hardware, uh, which means a lot more, you know, usage for the money uh, that we put into the hardware and the engineering behind it. And then they're really purpose driven, you know, not, not for a project uh, to be bound to it endlessly, but purpose driven for the code that the researcher wants to use that day. Um, and again, I probably most of the time they're going to, they're going to reuse the same sort of environment, maybe just be a one language sort of person. And that's fine. Um, they get the reusable history and then no matter what project you're working in, your home storage will always be the same. Your project storage will always be the same. Um, that is mapped to that specific project. So project X will have its own storage and Y will have its own storage and so on. And just a couple more slides here. Uh, 
what this gives us and running it in Kubernetes gives us some really special security and compliance features. So for one thing, we can run these containers in a pod, which is sort of a logical isolated network grouping within container uh, within Kubernetes. Uh, the overlays within Docker Swarm or within Kubernetes or DCOS or any of these, they're naturally encrypted, natively encrypted. So we have encryption between the containers themselves and how they speak to other ingress uh, controllers and so on. Um, we're authenticating the users through the proxy. We're authenticating the container itself to that actual user who requested it. And then as Tho already mentioned, we can do this just lets us do all sorts of continuous monitoring and logging for everything. So I can see exactly who requested what resource, when it was deployed for them, when they signed into it, how long their session was, when they left it, and so on. And it was really important at UVA to the information security team that, that we, really they wanted two things. They wanted people to have really good training, so high security training on how to work in an environment like this, but they also wanted a single cutoff point, a single choke point, and this authenticated proxy really does that for us. It gives us the ability, if we find a bad actor, that we can, um, we can close their connection. So this is a, just some example endpoints there on the right. Uh, they, they give nothing intelligent by the name. They're, in, they're authenticated through the proxy itself, but, but finally they also authenticate or require authentication from the user themselves. So that's kind of the structure of the endpoints and how they work. Uh, by the way, they would basically look for activity and we have some various tricks we can do to see if the user is still in their container or not, if they're still using it, give them a gracious you know, hour or two of extra time. And then if they haven't already disposed of their container, we can just do that automatically with a little cleanup process. But here's what the containers themselves could look like. This is a great tool from Eclipse called Thea, which is an IDE. So this gives us uh, a file manager on the left, you know, a, a drag and drop file manager. It gives us uh, intelligent coding um, for a variety of languages on the upper right. It gives us debugging tools. Um, this is another view of Thea. What's fantastic is Thea gives you a terminal built into the container itself. Uh, so you can actually iterate on your code and debug it up top. And then when you're ready to analyze and run it against your data, you can just do that from the command line here. And what we envision and what we'd like to move to eventually is an, is an ability to use that, that command line to, um, to start a job and, and run the job in, uh, you know, in detached form from the user environment itself. So let's say I've worked on my code for a couple hours and I'm ready to kind of kick it off. I could kick it off here close my browser, the job's going to run to completion and then just send me an email when it's done. So there's a little bit of a sense in which that's sort of a slurm HPC sort of job, but we can actually do that natively within, uh, within Kubernetes. Uh, another option would be Jupyter Notebooks. A lot of folks uh, we find just want to iterate on their code and use little small samples and kind of get things right or possibly just you know, run some plots and get some visualizations to pull out for, uh, for publishing and so on. Um, same thing with RStudio. And the latter of these two are really, really pretty simple to, to integrate. So this kind of tries to summarize everything. What, we're, what we have for users is using in common authentication. We're using co-manage for authorization. So it manages groups and projects that people are in. Um, the MFA is offloaded to their home and institution. We can do posture checking as part of the authenticated proxy. Um, then for data and code, it's all project-based. So it's kind of stored within the same realm. So we can support all these different languages and software, and hopefully over time, build up a suite of containers that fit all the different needs um, instead of having to hop from VM to VM and try to install it here and there and kind of losing track of that or how to automate that. It, um, with, with tools. This, this lets us automate it basically from the, from the image forward. So if we have an image that has all the tools or, you know, the specific tools that somebody needs and it's, it's ready to go for anybody who asks for it, not just for that one researcher uh, and using Globus for data. And then on the right, there's the isolated environments. This gives us really quick provisioning. These things are completely disposable. 
you know, it's not that they enter into a stopped state when the researcher's done that day, they are disposed of. Uh, and the ingredients to sort of reconstitute one are really simple. All, all we need to know is who's using it, what image do they want to use, and what project storage do they want to attach to. And that, that's essentially the recipe for, a, for an environment. Um, eventually, we'd like to offer maybe a range of CPU and memory options. I think we'll kind of hard code those to begin with, um, especially as we go towards GPU and, and so on. I think it'll be good for people to dial those in themselves. Uh, then just here's a final kind of close up of this environment. Um, again, your project at the top, your, your, uh, the specific environment you'd like in the second set of options, and then you click start. Um, so yeah, so that is, uh, that's the quick overview, uh, technically, and I'd, I'd love to address any questions you've got about that, or I know there's a governance question, policy questions already that came up, but I'll, I'll stop right there. So let's just read through a couple of things that came through, um, just so it's captured in the recording. Sure. Um, yeah, so we've got a question about, um, I hope you'll speak to specific regulations. You are hoping to provide compliance for in this model. Um, can we just briefly touch on those again? Sure, this is Ron. <clears throat> I'll address that briefly here. Um, we started, our attempt up front was to have one, one environment that would handle multiple of these different compliance models. So we had a, a HIPAA certified machine, Ivy. Uh, we went through about a two-year process to convert it into a compliant CUI environment for University of Virginia. And uh, that was a lot of work. Uh, it took a lot of, a lot of pain. Uh, what we found is, although we were successful at that, our HIPAA researchers were not happy with the changes in the onboarding process. <clears throat> and so we're about in the position to pull that apart into separate environments. So although it will still be in the Accord uh, you know, playpen, it will be a separate environment. Uh, and um, we are intending to go after a CMMC updates to that CUI environment. Uh, I think, Jay, you're asking that. Um, our most, most of our users want HIPAA or FERPA. They are, we have a few that are interested in the CUI, and uh, those are uh, a lot of work for us, but we are prepared to work. We've done a couple of onboards. We have several projects running in the CUI environment right now. So basically, from a compliance standpoint, uh, CUI is the worst, HIPAA is the, the one that's more useful, and we have some of our social scientists looking at a, a, a FERPA environment. And then we have the business confidential information that we are, are protecting as well. So it's not always the regulations that we're complying with, it is sometimes just business rules that are, that are negotiated through our office of sponsored programs. So hopefully that answers that question. And then there was a question um, when we were looking at the architecture, someone was asking, are the, the VPN sessions using multi-factor? And you said, yes, they're using Duo. And then we had a question, who manages the people over the project lifecycle? And the re reply was the PI of the project is responsible. Um, there's an IRB for anything with people. Okay. If I could respond a little bit more to that. Sure. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is uh, basically an outside researcher can choose which IRB to use, their own and their own you know, institution, if they have an IRB, or they could use ours. Uh, uh, there's probably going to be a bit of a charge to use our IRB, but uh, that is a possibility. And we've, we've done a lot of work thinking through how can, we, uh, how can we manage the data that's on here. And it, it's basically the PI is the only one who knows exactly what data has to be protected. So the PI trains every year and is responsible for all of the folks in his project in order to maintain the, the privacy and the security of their data. And then we've got a question um, about the cost to use Accord um, and how does the user request an account? So uh, we've got a response from Tho, uh, Accord is free um, through the NSF funding and they're in the early uh, friendly user stage. So um, if you want to, if you're interested in getting an account, you could email um, ntho, t n t h o at virginia.edu to get started. Um, I can actually put that in the chat too. Jeanette, if I can, can, yeah, go ahead. If I can elaborate a little bit. Uh, the NSF is funding this project. 
And so uh, for the partners in the Accord grant, uh, it's free access to them. So starting with the partners inside of Virginia, uh, the public universities in Virginia, those have access that we allocate. We have a governance model where uh, everyone gets access, but they also, uh, we don't provide a lot of storage. So if, if, for example, Virginia Tech, who's one of our partners, is gonna bring a large data set in, they may wanna bring storage in as well, purchase some storage and bring it to the table. And it becomes their sort of condominium storage to use on the machine. That's one of the models. Now we received a, a supplement award from NSF uh, back in, um, I think, April this year to expand the Accord usage to host COVID research for researchers around the country. Now, this, this can get confusing. What we're not doing is building a shared repository of COVID data. Uh, NIH is doing that with the N3C uh, project. There's several other larger projects building shared data repositories. Uh, and sharing the data on Accord isn't as easy as you might think. Uh, because you have all the permissions and so forth. As Neil described, the containers are isolated, they're secured, and so a researcher brings their own data in and does their own research on that data. That's the model that we're using today. So outside parties uh, doing COVID research have, uh, yeah, we don't charge for access for that either, but it's a very constrained view for a lot of folks. So hope that helps. It's, it's funny timing because we had some questions um, about COVID, your COVID research um, pop in just as you were speaking to that. So um, for the attendee who asked that, uh, please uh, ask a follow-up if that didn't address um, what you were asking. And then, um, so did you want to talk more about this slide before we move on to um, other questions? Um, yes, absolutely. I um, just want to wrap up. Um, so far, we, uh, we're a little bit less than a year into this. We, what we've learned, um, well, I think we've all learned this, but um, it's, it's reinforced um, that really the, um, um, the devil is in the details, right? When it comes to building CI and um, getting it working and getting people to use it, the, you know, even a, you know, it's things that seems like it should be working it's um when you actually deploy it end to end uh, there there are challenges and um we also finding that to be with our policies with our uh, with our lawyers right um the now this agreement should be pretty straightforward uh, manage your own risk kind of thing but then again um you know it um it isn't as, as straightforward as, as it should be um we had a heck of a time figuring out the details for insurance for example and so we are now very interested in um, offering a code as an environment um, to test out some of these um, CI innovations. Uh, for example, if you are, um, and when we are working with someone potentially looking into this, um, you, you may have heard that, oh yeah, blockchain is gonna take care of all your data accountability issues. Well then, when, when we look into it, um, there's a whole huge gap where the enforcement is, um, step is, uh, you know, when, when you, when you're dealing with data and, and such, like how do you enforce violations and things? And so this is where um, a core may be able to help because our environment include, um, for example, as Ron mentioned, uh, for example, bringing in um, like uh, connecting with IRBs, institutional IRBs. And so uh, that may be a place where enforcement could be. Right? Um, and then there are folks who may be interested in, um, um, you know, perhaps uh, persisting um, containers and uh, workflows um, to, you know, memory or something so that they can, um, preserve reproducibility. There's, there's been a bit of work on that. Um, and we, we, we create an environment that, um, have these, these various components, um, in place that, um, we would be interested in, uh, help to deploy some of these tools because we think they're very helpful. Um, they're potentially very helpful for the community, uh, but until we can deploy them end to end, it's, it's difficult to really assess that. And so, if anyone is interested, uh, we are we uh, we are open to that partnership as well. So, Jeanette, if I could jump in real quick, there's a couple of details here that I think are important to folks that we we mentioned, but we sort of glossed over. Uh, we started this project around Cui, as I mentioned. We had a HIPAA compliant uh, machine for inside of UVA, but we started on Cui, uh, and then we had other requests from our partners in the Accord. Uh, community around, could they host Cui on our machine as well? When I started asking about that, I was told, well, if you do that, you need to have a, a FedRAMP compliance, which is 1,200 pages of forms that you fill out or something like that. 
Uh, but it was only when we started asking for details, and this is where I think a court is, is I think, bringing value is, we're, as Stone mentioned, the devil's in the details. We're trying to investigate all of the details around this to find ways to cut through some of the, the complexities and to make things possible that we didn't think were possible. The fact that we're in a state, a commonwealth, that has a common attorney general's office that manages all of the legal aspects of all of our universities puts us basically in the same organization. We're in the same legal organization in the state. Uh, we don't sue each other, as Stowe mentioned up front, because we're the same organization. You know, how can you sue yourself? We also, amazingly enough, have the same cyber insurance. And when we started digging into cyber insurance, we found a few things that were interesting. Uh, number one is, uh, for example, UVA's cyber insurance won't cover Virginia Tech's data on our machine. But UVA's cyber insurance will cover our data on Virginia Tech's machine. So if we have the same company, then Virginia Tech's data is covered by their insurance on our machine. Now that doesn't cover all the risks and all the levels of liability, but it's a starting point for us. So it's those details that we had to pry out of our legal counsel and our risk management folks that allowed us to move forward with this. And I think those are very, very interesting. When we started talking about folks outside of the Commonwealth, all bets are off. So there's no way we have of hosting CUI data for anybody outside of the Commonwealth with this. But HIPAA data is a different story. So Again, all of these things are handcrafted based on what the policies are and what the, the risks are and what the, what the uh, uh, risk avoidance processes are. And I'll stop there and see if that generates any other questions. Sure. Um, let me uh, grab this, the screen back and I'll go over some community news so that people can um, type in more questions. So, Um, whoops, apologize. Um, so yes, we're in the question and answer session. Um, go ahead and type in your questions in the chat and uh, we'll go through them. Um, community updates. Uh, we've got two webinars coming up. Um, so it's funny that we're talking about this um, regulation um, guiding the Accord uh, architecture and everything like that. Uh, we've got um, on October 6th, at 11 a.m. Eastern, we've got a presentation on CMMC, uh, Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. And that's with uh, trusted CI Scott Russell. Scott has been very helpful in the um, GDPR guidance and, uh, and other regulations, um, helping um, interpret them and explain them to institutions. So if you're interested in this topic, please join us at that time. I'll be sending out a, um, I've already sent out a, a reminder to register to our announcements list, but I'll be sending that again, out again um, later this week. And then October 26th at 11 a.m., we've got RDP enforcing security and privacy policies to protect research data with uh, Yuan Tian. And then other um, community updates, we've got the 2021 Fellows Program application is open right now. It was just opened and announced um, last week. So if you're interested in becoming a trusted CI fellow, go to trustedci.org slash fellows. And then um, a little bit of a business. If you are interested in applying for an engagement with trusted CI, that application for the January to June time period is ending October 2nd. So that's, um, that's this Friday. So be on the lookout for that. If you're applying, you need to get your application in trustedci.org slash application. Um, and then more, more information, updates about webinar series, just go to trustedci.org slash webinars. So let's bounce back. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see the chat a little bit more easily. Um, so we had a follow-up question going back to the COVID-19 um, description that you provided. Um, how much work are you doing in the COVID-19 area? Um, are you working with NSF COVID funded researches such as the UVA team um, for virtual organization for computing research in pandemic preparedness and resilience. So if I'm, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, that particular award is to the Biocomplexity Institute at University of Virginia. Um, and they are working on multiple, multiple different platforms, but they are using the, they're using our platforms, not the one for sensitive data, but our open, more open uh, platform for uh, interpreting their results and visualizing, visualizing their results. Uh, we are open, the, uh, the 
Accord project is looking for researchers doing COVID research, especially NSF funded researchers who may not have uh, the ability to host the data on their own systems uh, to, to work with us on this. And so if you have folks that you'd like to send to us, feel free to. And then we've got another question here. Um, does CUI cover export control data? We do not handle export control data on our protected machines. Uh, Okay, so let's do um, one last call for questions. Um, and while people are typing, um, I just wanna say thank you very much for um, agreeing to present this. Um, we reached out to you and it, I'm very happy with, um, with how that went. Uh, people seem to be very interested in this new project. So it's exciting to um, have this opportunity to share it with others. Well, we're, we're happy to present and glad to present at any time. And one of the reasons that we present is to get feedback from the community. So please, if you have feedback, get in touch with us. You've got those address, Thos the project director for this project, and he can get to me or to Neil. So please do send us uh, any questions you've got and uh, let's have a conversation. We're all building this to together as a larger community. So please help us. Yeah, I, uh, I just posted uh, Tho's email address again. And uh, when, I, when I post this video uh, later to our announcements list, I'll include his email in the, in the message. All right, great. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Um, thank you, um, Ron, Tho, and Neil for presenting. Um, any final comments? Thank you so much for having us, definitely. And again, thank you all. And it's good to, good to talk to everyone. All right. Um, thanks again. And I'll be posting this video later today. Um, uh, to those of you who are still here, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. See y'all.